the anticipated dream vacation quickly turned into a nightmare ordeal. My wife, Pam, and I willingly rented a picturesque house on the shore of a serene lake, imagining a blissful week-long trip. But we didn't know yet that our joyful journey was about to change dramatically for the worse. Despite the fact that it was only noon on Monday, the torment had already begun to unfold. Soon, our friends Bill and Carol, who also rented a neighboring house, were due to arrive. Bill, the sales agent, said that he would arrive around 6 o'clock in the evening as he had a meeting with a client in the morning. To clarify the situation, let me start from the beginning and introduce myself. My name is Frank, and my wife is Pam. We are both about 30 years old and have been married for 8 years. We first met when I was a college senior and Pam was a junior. We dated for a year and a half, and after she graduated from college, we got married. In the summer after graduating from college, I joined a software development company. Two years later, I started the path of creating my own company. It took a lot of dedication and countless hours of hard work from me, but over the past year, my company has achieved significant growth and is currently thriving. In addition, my wife, Pam, also got a job after the wedding. Her earnings played a crucial role in maintaining our lives in the early years when we were experiencing financial difficulties. Pam works as a legal secretary at a well-known law firm in our hometown. Due to limited financial resources, we decided to postpone the birth of a child, and she diligently followed contraception measures. I am deeply fascinated by her exquisite beauty. As for me, I exercise regularly, usually twice a week. With a height of about 6 feet and 2 inches, I pay great attention to my physical shape. On Saturday afternoon, we arrived at our destination, making a short stop in the city to stock up on groceries and take a case of beer. The weather was just great, so we didn't waste time unloading things and arranging the house. When there was a little daylight left, we decided to make the most of it and go fishing. To our joy, the fish took a bite, and before dusk, we managed to catch three large fish. In anticipation of success, I quickly butchered the fish so that Pam could cook a delicious dinner. While Pam was tidying up, I took the opportunity to relax on the porch with a refreshing glass of beer. It was at this moment that I noticed a gentleman driving up to the neighboring house, in which our friends Bill and Carol soon settled. After bringing a few items into the house, he soon came out holding a beer in his hand. Intrigued by this sight, I decided to investigate the situation and approached him. After introducing myself, I found out that his name was Joe. Taller than me by about 2 centimeters and weighing about 50 kilograms, Joe had the strong physique of a football player. He told me that he belonged to a group of guys who owned a spacious cottage on the shore of a lake located about 10 miles from the city. But since the cottage in which he was supposed to live was not ready yet, he temporarily took refuge in this alternative housing until Monday. He knew that the cottage would be ready for him by Monday afternoon and that another couple would arrive later that day to stay in the same cottage. Around that time, Pam showed up and joined us. I introduced them to each other and couldn't help but notice Joe's overly friendly behavior towards Pam, as if he was undressing her with his eyes. After talking a little about fishing, the weather, and other topics, we returned to our house. Going into the house, I brought us both a beer. We sat and had a casual conversation, during which Pam started talking about Joe several times, asking about his place of residence and occupation. I wasn't particularly interested in Joe, so after finishing my beer, I suggested ending the evening. I quickly undressed and slipped under the covers, and Pam went to the bathroom. When she returned, she was wearing a nightgown, and I couldn't help but look forward to a pleasant evening ahead. After spending time together, I cuddled her to me and offered to go to bed, since I had to get up early to go fishing on the lake. Clinging to each other, we soon fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up to the fact that it was still dark outside the window. Looking at the clock, I saw that it showed 4.30 a.m., which was quite consistent with my plans. Soon, I got to the bathroom. When I was done, I went back to bed and gently woke Pam up. I informed her that we had an important fishing trip and asked her to go to the kitchen and make coffee while I took a quick shower. After the shower, I put on jeans, a t-shirt, and flip-flops and headed to the kitchen. Strangely, Pam didn't turn on the light. Just as I was about to do this, she whispered urgently, don't turn on the light. Curious, I looked around the dimly lit kitchen and noticed that she was looking out the window. 
quietly approaching her from behind, I leaned over to her and looked through the window behind her. The neighboring house, located only 20 feet away, allowed us to look into their bedroom from the window of our kitchen. And there, in all his glory, stood Joe with a towel wrapped around his head, drying his hair. That's what caught Pam's attention. I didn't say a word to her. After that, I made coffee for both of us. Pam was going to take a shower, so I asked her to get dressed and meet me at the dock. When Pam finally boarded the boat, I pushed us away and started the outboard motor. As I made my way to the lake, I was overcome by a sense of calm, allowing me to fully immerse myself in the process. This time of day has always been my favorite, as the scorching heat has not yet come, and the absence of wind created a serene atmosphere. It was the perfect moment for basic fishing. Approaching the shore, I skillfully turned off the engine, allowing the boat to drift gently. I took Pam by the arm, prepared her fishing rod, making sure that everything was in order and she would enjoy fishing. Taking a seat in the middle, I plunged the paddle into the calm water, placing us about 50 feet from the shore. It was time to focus on my spinning rod. I picked it up and started casting. To my delight, already on the second casting, I felt a strong tension on the fishing line. Quickly reeling in the line, I successfully caught a solid 16-pound base. Pam also experienced excitement when she threw for the fifth time. Two hours later, we returned to the pier, but fishing for Pam was not successful. She managed to catch only one fish, while I caught three decent specimens from which it would be possible to cook a delicious lunch. It seemed that Pam was distracted all the time, as most of her casts did not reach the goal. In addition, she faced numerous obstacles. She got tangled in water lilies three times and even caught a fishing line on a tree branch near the shore. After securing the boat, I asked Pam to bring me a beer while I cleaned the fish. When I reached the cabin, I noticed that Pam had changed into a bathing suit. I hugged her and kissed her, but she quickly pushed me away, urging me to go to the kitchen and cook fish. Hunger was growing, and I was not against fulfilling her request. As it was customary for our fishing trips, I took up frying fish with pleasure. When we had a hearty meal washed down with a refreshing cold beer, I was overcome with a sense of satisfaction. All I wanted was a little nap to get back to the main purpose of our trip, fishing. But Pam had other plans. She longed for a conversation, but, as on the previous evening, hung around Joe. I noticed how she looked out of the window, unnoticed. We've been watching him closely, but we haven't noticed him yet. I playfully teased her that I wanted to see him again. She answered this with slight annoyance and said that she was going outside to bask in the sun. Let me take a nap if I want. Waking up from a nap, I looked at my watch and realized that it was already three o'clock. Hastily getting to my feet, I went in search of Pam. Eventually, I saw her lying on a blanket behind the house. As I approached her, I noticed that she, like me, had dozed off. Her skin was slightly reddened from the sun, so I gently woke her up and suggested finding shade before she got burned. When we got back to the house, I kindly asked her to get dressed so we could go fishing. But she expressed her dissatisfaction with the fact that she was in the sun all day and refused my offer to go out on the lake at the hottest time of the day. Instead, she suggested that I go fishing alone and promised that she would cook dinner for me when I returned. Deciding to spend time usefully, I went to the opposite shore of the lake, where there were few resorts and a majestic pine forest stretched to the water's edge. Although it wasn't so pleasant without Pam's company, I continued fishing for almost three more hours. Unfortunately, luck was not on my side. But given the unfavorable time of day, I did not expect more. Before returning to the shore, I managed to catch one fish. Pam promised to cook a delicious dinner for me and did not disappoint. After enjoying dinner and helping her wash the dishes, we decided to relax on the veranda. Unexpectedly, Pam touched on the topic of intimate fantasies. I confessed that I fantasized about making love to her, but she surprised me by asking if I had any desires related to another woman. I replied that I only loved her and that she was more than enough for me. Curious, I asked if she had any secret fantasies of her own. Pam confirmed that she has always been devoted only to me. I don't want to jeopardize our marriage. I want us to grow old together. But I also have a fantasy that I would like to realize. I'm asking your permission to spend tonight with Joe, just one night. After that, he will disappear from our lives forever. 
When she spoke, I felt a wave of shock and disbelief wash over me. What? I managed to say, tears welled up in my eyes. Please, Pam, please think. You know how much I love you. I adore and cherish you. Please, let's not go down this path, I begged. In response, she said, if you really loved me, you would want me to have everything I desire. I understand that you don't want me to fulfill my only fantasy, which is to spend the night with Joe. But I want to note that with the onset of mourning, we will return to our usual dynamics, in which our love for each other remains unchanged. Rest assured that our friends Bill and Carol, who will arrive tomorrow evening, will remain in the dark about this meeting, which will allow us to continue our vacation as if nothing had happened. But I have concerns about the possibility of disease. It looks like you've already made a detailed plan without finding out Joe's biography to the end and without discussing this issue with me in advance. Yes, she said, I have already decided that I will go for it because I believe that if you really love me, you will let me do it. We argued hotly for another 30 minutes, but I could not convince her. In her eyes, my sincere love for her meant giving her freedom of action. As dusk fell, Pam looked around Joe's cottage and noticed that he was walking around the neighborhood. After convincing me to get into the car, she insisted that I park it nearby and return to the cottage on foot without turning on the lights to spend the night there. In order to inform Joe about my business in the city and about my expected return tomorrow, I decided to take a certain route. When I drove onto the ring road passing near the resort, my vision became blurry because of the tears coming to my eyes. I turned in the direction of the city and drove about a mile in search of a place to turn around. On the way back, I parked the car at a nearby boarding house so that it would be invisible. The distance between our cottage and the back door was about 70 yards and covered a woodland area. Overwhelmed with emotions, I entered the cottage and collapsed on the bed, not knowing if I had the strength to get up. Was it interesting for me to look into the window of the neighboring house to see how another man is engaged in intimate action with Pam, or did I just prefer to stay lying here, inventing vivid scenarios in my mind? I can only say that it finally dawned on me, despite the fact that we had been married for eight years, I really did not understand who Pam really was. It seems that now I am observing a previously unknown side of her. When I woke up on Monday morning, I looked at my watch and realized that it was already 10.30 a.m. She'd be back early in the morning, but she wasn't in sight yet. Just five minutes later, Joe and Pam left the house and headed to his car. When she entered the door, she noticed me and hurriedly came over, hugging me tightly. She was going to kiss me passionately on the lips, but I instinctively turned away at the last moment. God, Frank, I love you, she exclaimed, her voice full of gratitude for the incredible night we spent together. Don't thank me, Pam, I replied, shaking my head. I didn't take any part in it. I specifically asked you to refrain from this. If you remember correctly, I even begged you not to do it. And now look at the result. It seems that you have turned into a person with a dubious character. Please, Frank, she pleaded. Let's not let this define us. This is already in the past, and we can return to the old relationship. I've indulged all your desires, and that's all I've ever wanted. Well, I have to admit that in one aspect, you're right. Now it's really over. Our marriage may also be on the verge of ending, or even if it persists, it will never be the same. A shocked expression appeared on Pam's face as she looked at me with a heavy heart. I expressed my feelings, Pam. I loved you. I begged you to be faithful. But what did you do? You callously said that my words didn't matter and that you would get your way regardless of my requests. Where is the love you claim to love me, Pam? It seems obvious to me that you were only attached to yourself and to what you could get. Tears began to flow down Pam's face, and she began to sob. Through tears, she was able to say, Frank, I really love you. It's just that when I saw Joe, something stirred in me. But please know, Frank, my love for you is sincere. I cherish the way you make love to me, but Joe continued to occupy my thoughts relentlessly. It wasn't love. Frank, it was pure fantasy. When I looked at her, a wave of disgust swept over me. Why don't you go and take a shower? I suggested. And then we have to have a serious conversation about our future and whether our marriage will survive the events that have happened. She begged me, assuring him that her love belongs only to me. It's you, Frank, that I really love. 
let's continue as if last night never happened. But how can we move on, ignoring the severity of what happened? Pam entered the bedroom and collapsed on the bed, still bursting into tears. I think it would be better if you took a shower before going to bed, I suggested, fearing that she's dirty. But Pam answered, I'm too tired right now. I hardly slept today, maybe only 30 minutes. I'm going to take a nap and then take a shower before we start talking. She was already fast asleep. I bent down and picked up her robe, finding a business card in its pocket. It had Joe's name and phone number on it. At that moment, I thought about breaking it, but in the end, decided not to. This could serve as a test of Pam's loyalty. If she contacted him, he could offer her a job in the future. I had a premonition that I would soon find out about the situation with Joe. I couldn't risk being intimate with Pam until I was sure she didn't have sexually transmitted diseases. Going outside and sitting in a chair on the lawn, I looked back at the neighboring house. It was hard to resist feeling resentful of Joe. But how could I blame him? If a beautiful woman came up to me and expressed her desire, how would I react? Despite the fact that I'm happily married and have no intention of cheating on my wife, I must admit that I would be strongly tempted. So, how can I put the blame on Joe? I had a problem, and it revolved around Pam. Will I ever be able to regain her trust? Does she really love me, or will she succumb to the temptation to go astray again? Returning to the house, I considered the idea of packing up and leaving, with or without Pam. But I've been looking forward to this vacation for the last four years. It's been too long since we've experienced a real vacation, not just a short-term escape from home. In the end, I made the decision to stay and make the most of it, enjoying fishing with Bill and Carol. Despite the fact that my heart was shattered initially, I expected that I would fish alone most of the time and not with Pam as previously planned. I still didn't know how to deal with Bill and Carol about Pam's act. At this point, I still wanted them to not know about what Pam had done. Having solved this issue, I went to the second bedroom to settle down for the night. It was clear that I wasn't going to sleep in the same bed with Pam. Finding sheets and pillowcases, I made the bed and returned to the other bedroom where Pam was still sleeping. I gathered up all my clothes and moved them to the other bedroom. When I was finishing putting things in the closet, the sound of a car pulling up caught my attention. Driven by curiosity, I went to the window and saw that Bill and Carol had finally arrived. Suppressing my emotions, I tried to look indifferent and headed towards them. I didn't want them to witness my inner experience. Well, look who finally decided to join us. I greeted them with a forced smile. As I got closer, I noticed a third person sitting in the back seat of the car. What brings you here? I asked, genuinely surprised. Bill replied, I assume that by the time we arrived, you and Pam would be fishing on the lake. Oh, and we also took Sister Carol with us. Jane, meet my closest friend, Frank. When she got out of the car, I couldn't help but admire her appearance. Hi, Frank, nice to meet you, she greeted. Hi, Jane, I replied, watching her. At first, I thought she was still a teenager, but knowing that Carol is 30 years old, I realized that she must be older than she seems. Meanwhile, Carol came up from the other side of the car and asked, Where's Pam? And what is it with your eyes? They look red and bloodshot. I didn't expect her to notice it so quickly. Trying to come up with an explanation quickly, I replied, it's probably because of the fresh air. I think I'm allergic. I told everyone that Pam wasn't feeling well right now. The last time I saw her, she was fast asleep, completely exhausted. Hey, guys, I could use some help carrying all these things, Bill exclaimed, lifting the suitcase out of the trunk. We all rushed to help him. Bill and Carol went into the front bedroom and put their suitcases on the bed. I assumed that the back room would belong to Jane, the one in which Pam had indulged in her fantasies the previous night. She will sleep in the bedroom located directly opposite the window of our kitchen. Maybe I'll get lucky like Pam, I mused. Bill came into the kitchen, putting several bags of groceries on the table. Take your fishing gear, Bill, I suggested. The girls can unpack while we go fishing. Sure, if they don't mind, Bill replied. You guys go, Carol cut in. We can arrange things better without the two of you. I told Bill to pack up his gear and meet me at the dock. Back at our cabin, 
I went into the bedroom where Pam was still sleeping. I shook her gently to wake her up. What's going on, Frank? What is it? She asked. You need to freshen up, I advised. I said that if you didn't want Carol to see you in an inappropriate way, then it was better to clean up. Both Bill and Carol are here, and Bill and I are going fishing. Carol may be coming to visit you soon, so I advise you to freshen up if you don't want her to suspect the cause of your discomfort. When we got to the dock, I noticed that Bill was already there and was getting ready for our trip. Pushing the boat away, Bill started the engine, and we set off across the lake. At that moment, I didn't care much about what would happen to Pam if she felt embarrassed or humiliated. I can only say that she brought it on herself. Now she may face the consequences. When Bill reached the other side of the lake, he turned off the engine, and I took control, paddling carefully so that we stayed close enough to the shore to cast. Slowly, we made our way to the upper part of the lake. We both started casting fishing rods, taking advantage of the fact that it was already about 7 o'clock. According to my calculations, there was about an hour left before returning. Bill was the first to catch something significant, a 19-inch fish weighing about 4 pounds. He carefully put her in the net and lowered her into the water. Being in a talkative mood, Bill suddenly apologized for taking Jane with him. Carol and I have come to a mutual agreement that this is exactly what she needs right now. She needs a break from the unbearable pressure of everyday life. Only last week, her divorce was finalized, and the emotional blow he dealt her was very strong. Carol showed genuine concern for her well-being, saying that she was consumed by sadness to such an extent that she could not sleep or even find an appetite. It's hard to believe that she's already divorced. She looks much younger than her marital status would suggest. She has no doubt about her ex-husband's betrayal when she caught him red-handed with another woman right in their bed. I believe he's been cheating on her since the day they got married three years ago. Wow, it's very hard, I sympathized. Cheating on a partner can cause great pain and suffering. During our visit this week, we should try to cheer her up. Now that the divorce is finalized, the most difficult thing for her is over. She can only move on and enter a new life. Of course, we advise her. So it is very important for her to redirect her thoughts away from the divorce. Bill joined in the conversation, noting that she was an attractive woman. I replied, assuring him that there would be countless men who would want to get to know her better. I believe that the appearance of a new love interest can distract her from her problems, I said. She speaks as if she has completely lost faith in men and has made a solemn commitment to avoid them. It seems that in order to attract her interest, you need someone really exceptional, I admitted. But surprises have happened before. But this vacation should bring some comfort. Being away from home, diving into the serene atmosphere of the lake, fishing, communicating with nature may help her relax and switch her attention to other issues. After resuming fishing for an hour, we managed to catch a few more perches, which were enough for a hearty dinner. When the sun disappeared below the horizon, we returned to the pier, cleaned ourselves up, and butchered the fish. I insisted that Bill take the fish to enjoy her meal. Arriving at our house, I was surprised to see that Pam had already cleaned herself up, dressed in trousers and a turtleneck sweater that hid her bruises and hickeys. Without delay, she offered to cook us dinner, to which I agreed. While she started cooking, I took a quick shower to freshen up. Lost in my thoughts, I calmly devoured my food, thinking over the words I wanted to say to her and figuring out how best to convey them. When I was done, I reached for a beer and settled into the front room. Pam, meanwhile, was diligently tidying up the kitchen and then joined me, leisurely sipping a glass of raspberry wine. Sensing an opportune moment, she spoke up. I think now is the right time for that lengthy conversation you were talking about. But before we get to it, I want you to know that my love is meant only for you. Last night was just a fleeting desire, an opportunity to realize an old fantasy. It's all over now, and we can move on as if it never happened. Of course, if you find the strength in your heart to forgive me. Oh, so that's your point of view. You think that all I have to do is forgive you, and our relationship will magically be restored. It seems that you have no remorse for the humiliation and deception that you put me through. You just think that forgiveness is the solution to all problems, not realizing what a huge offense and pain I experienced last night. How can I trust you again after such a betrayal? How long will you crave new fantasies? Please, 
Frank, she cried. I never thought that my actions could jeopardize our marriage. I even thought that you would find pleasure in watching another man's intimacy with me. Listen, Pam, I said firmly. I want to clarify something. I'm not like these other men. I despise the idea of infidelity. If I even suspect that you were with another man, our marriage will be in jeopardy. Moreover, I still haven't decided on our future. Can you realize the gravity of the situation? Your actions endangered not only our marriage, but also our lives. Have you thought about the fact that there are countless sexually transmitted diseases? As soon as we get home, you will be examined. One thing I can say for sure, we will not engage in any intimate relations until the end of the vacation. Pam started to cry, and she whispered, Oh Frank, it was nice, but as I said, it's in the past. I am deeply sorry for hurting you, and I promise that it will never happen again. I realized my fantasy, and now my only desire is to restore our previous relationship as if nothing had happened. Please understand that if this happened again, our marriage would be irreparably damaged. You understand that, don't you? We can't just go back to the old relationship because what happened will forever remain a part of our history, Pam, because it really happened. I used to love you with all my heart, but now I'm not sure. You must return my love and trust with your unwavering loyalty. In the future, I want to make it clear that I have a fantasy that I can realize in the future. Perhaps you can relate to the fact that you are in a similar situation, and I hope that you will treat this with understanding. I won't be happy with it, she admitted, but I can try to understand your emotions. The next morning, before sunrise, I crept into the kitchen to catch a glimpse of Jane's bedroom. It looks like I came too early since her room was still in darkness. Turning on the light, I started making coffee. While I was sitting at the table enjoying my coffee, Pam came out of the bedroom in her usual outfit, trousers, and a turtleneck sweater. I told her that if she was planning to join me on a fishing trip, then after sunrise, she might become uncomfortably hot because of the chosen clothes. But she said she wasn't interested in fishing and suggested I go alone. Trying to entice her, I told her about my friends Bill and Carol, as well as about Carol's sister Jane, who were going to meet us at the pier. I asked Pam if she would like to join me and meet them. She replied, No, Frank. These are your friends, not mine. Just let them know that I'm still not feeling very well and prefer to sleep today. I plan to meet them later when I come to my senses. Besides, it still hurts and bothers me that I have to wear these bulky clothes to hide the bruises. When I went down to the dock with a thermos for coffee and fishing accessories, Bill was just finishing fixing the motor of his boat which he and Carol would use. The girls will join us soon. Where's Pam? Still not feeling well. She said that she wants to sleep today and hopes that by tomorrow she will be better, I said. Since there's not enough room in the boat for all four of us, why don't you take Jane with you? She hadn't gone fishing since she was a child, but her father loved to do it. Carol seems to have inherited this passion, but Jane has never shown much interest. You may have to teach her how to catch, especially with these open lid spinning rods. To be honest, I feel relieved that I won't have to take on this task myself, he grinned. I'm sure it won't be too difficult. I assume that if she had experienced using old casting reels, then she would easily master them. The advantage of spinning reels is that they do not have backlash. While we were waiting for the girls, we talked and discussed the place of our fishing. I told Bill that I was fishing on the far side of the lake where there were no cottages, and the forest reached to the water's edge. Bill decided to stay on this side with Carol for the time being and fish along the shore towards the spillway in the southern part of the lake. At that moment, Carol and Jane walked down the path to the pier. Bill informed them of our decision, and Jane burst out laughing, teasing me for what I had gotten myself into. As soon as Jane got into the boat, I gently pushed us away from the dock and started the engine directing us to the opposite shore of the lake. At this time, I took the opportunity to observe Jane more closely. She had undeniable beauty and looked much younger than her 26 years, perhaps she was closer to 18 or 19. I realized that I needed to focus on fishing and not let my thoughts wander over Jane, as in this case, I would undoubtedly embarrass myself. Thinking about Pam and the nagging pain in my stomach, I couldn't help but dwell on the combination of her actions and dismissive attitude towards them. She didn't understand the seriousness of the situation, she just dismissed it as her own fantasy. But the pain and humiliation I was experiencing, 
she didn't seem to understand. Perhaps I should seek solace elsewhere, maybe I should try to captivate Jane by letting myself indulge in my own fantasies. Undoubtedly, Jane had the same beauty as Pam, which made this venture even more tempting. When I was thinking about the situation, it dawned on me, the idea that came to my mind was, of course, terrible. Bill and Carol, whom I consider close friends, will certainly disapprove of my plan to manipulate Jane as a means of revenge against Pam, especially given the difficulties that Jane has recently experienced in connection with the divorce. Moreover, it would be extremely unfair to Jane herself if she found out that I was using her to get revenge on Pam, she would most likely hold a strong grudge against me. No indulging in fantasies of seducing Jane and having a passionate affair would lead me to follow the path of mirroring Pam's behavior and eventually harm both Jane and myself. When we reached the other shore and I turned off the engine, Jane asked me to bait her hook. I grinned and explained that we don't use live bait, only artificial baits. Throwing them in and reeling them back in is all it takes. Over and over again. Attaching a silver spoon and a pork rind to our fishing line, I handed her the rod. But when she looked at the reel, she was surprised. How could she catch with it? Before that, she had only seen casting reels that were very different from this one. I quickly replaced the fishing line with a lure with a spinner, demonstrating how to cast the fishing line with this particular reel. First, you need to open the shackle and perform the same casting motion as on the old coils. Instead of using your thumb to pull the line off the reel, use your index finger. Just point your finger in the direction where you want to direct the bait, I explained. Sounds simple, she replied, wanting to try. She confidently made a powerful throw but could not release the line in time, resulting in a loud splash just five feet from the tip of the rod. Realizing her mistake, she started changing hands to wind up the fishing line, but I quickly corrected her. A spinning rod needs to be wound with the left hand. There's no need to change hands on the rod. Watch me do it, I instructed. There's no need to make strong and grandiose swings with a spinning rod. Just remember the positions 10 and 2. Return the rod to the position 10 o'clock, take a short pause, and feel the whip of the rod. Then smoothly move it forward to the 2 o'clock position. As soon as the rod is between 12 and 1, release the line from the index finger. Okay, now try again. On her next attempt, she showed a slight improvement but let go of the line too early, causing the bait to shoot up 30 to 40 feet and fall about 20 feet in front of her. Come here, I said, offering her a seat in front of me. Now, put your hand on mine and familiarize yourself with the technique. Sitting down opposite me, she subtly leaned back, and at that moment, I felt an undeniable physical reaction. In order not to feel discomfort, I changed my position, trying to demonstrate the art of throwing for range and accuracy. Her intoxicating fragrance overwhelmed me, her hair exuded a delicate scent of lilac. The feeling of her pressing against my chest was indescribable. After several attempts, she turned to face me, a radiant smile lighting up her features. I think I understand everything now, she said, moving closer to me. Again, I wanted to hug her and cling to her lips. At this very moment, grinning, she got up from her seat and returned to the bow of the boat. Yes, she exclaimed. I think I understand everything now. We decided to take a break, and I kindly served each of us a cup of coffee. Curiosity was aroused, and I asked Jane to tell me more about herself, mentioning that Bill had mentioned her recent divorce. Yes, she replied. I don't know how I would have coped without the constant support of Bill and Carol. They convinced me to join them on vacation, even though I knew they wanted to be alone. Staying in these tiny houses, they could limit their personal space if I was around. But at the same time, they made me realize that I am still young and have my whole life ahead of me. That's why I decided to live life to the fullest and find joy in every moment. Setting aside the cup of coffee, we continued our fishing. We were approaching the upper part of the lake, where numerous streams flowed into its waters. We successfully threw our fishing rods into the stream and were able to catch two more decent-sized perches. At that moment, I noticed that Jane was fidgeting uncomfortably, and she admitted that the coffee she drank made her want to urinate. I mentioned that I have a jar for my own use, but realized that she might not be thrilled with the idea. Instead, I suggested stopping at a sandbank located at the mouth of the stream, then Jane could retire to the nearest trees and relieve herself. 
we turned onto a sandbank and Jane hurried towards the trees. After a while, she came back and told me about the hidden path among the trees, going away from the lake and going along the stream. Driven by curiosity, she asked if I wanted to know where it led. Of course, I replied, ready for a spontaneous adventure. We carefully secured the boat on the sandy shore and set off through the lush foliage. Jane showed me the way, and when we had walked along it for about a quarter of a mile, I saw a delightful grassy mound lying ahead. When we got to the top of it, an amazing picture opened up before us. Velvety grass gently descended to the purest waters of a small, untouched lake. The lake was surrounded by a picturesque picture of an ancient forest consisting of ancient oaks, maples, and many birches with characteristic brown and white bark. Stretching for about half a mile in length, the lake gradually widened and narrowed at a distance of one to two hundred yards. Surprisingly, there were no signs of human presence in its surroundings, which created an untouched atmosphere. This sight was mesmerizing, like a perfect picture on a postcard. As we were both looking at the calm waters, a thought occurred to me. It seems that this lake has rarely been explored for fishing, if at all. Perhaps the locals knew about its existence, as evidenced by the path leading to it, but it remained practically undeveloped by tourists and vacationers. I think this lake is just amazing, I commented, marveling at its pristine appearance. Maybe at the end of this week, we will bring a boat here and try fishing. Her eyes lit up with excitement. She turned in my arms, her hands gently wrapped around the back of my head. I'd love to, she whispered, pulling me closer until our lips met. I kissed her, feeling a surge of emotion. She admitted that she did not understand what had come over her, but she did not regret anything. It's only been a day since we met, but it feels like we've known each other for ages, she admitted. I feel the same way, I reassured her. Bill said you're out of a relationship and don't want to get involved with anyone else, not in the near future and probably not for a long time. You know, it really is, she said. But for some inexplicable reason, I don't feel the same way about you. Maybe it's because you're close friends with Bill and Carol. I think we should go back before something unpleasant happens. They may assume that we are lost or even worse, drowned. It's probably already an hour. It seems we missed lunch. It was already two o'clock when we finally returned to the pier. On the way back, I asked Jane to keep our discovery of the lake a secret from Bill and Carol. Let's cherish it as our own secret place, Jane and I agreed to go fishing at the end of the week, and she agreed. When we arrived at the pier, Bill was already waiting for us, expressing his readiness to get into his boat and go in search of us. When we proudly showed the fish we had caught, Bill was genuinely delighted but he admitted that he and Carol were not very lucky. They caught only one perch. In secret, he told me that it was Carol who caught him on the bait. Taking responsibility, Bill took our fish, promising to clean it, and offered us a snack before we parted. I hugged Jane, kissed her gently on the cheek, told her that I really liked our fishing, and arranged to meet later. When I got back to our house, Pam took out her anger on me, looking at me piercingly. She asked, where have you been? You were supposed to be back two hours ago. I saw you kissing her on the dock. Impatient as always, aren't you? You probably think you can avoid her all week. Well, you know what? All this week, I will accompany you on a fishing trip. Trying to clear up the misunderstanding, I calmly replied, Pam, you've got it all wrong. We were just fishing. You're the one avoiding people, not Jane. She has recently gone through a divorce and understands the pain and humiliation caused by her partner's infidelity. It looks like you still haven't sorted out this problem. You continue to believe that we can effortlessly return to the state as if nothing had happened. Given the way you've been thinking about it, I'm sure this is just the first of many cases we'll have to go through. That's why you're so annoyed. You remember how it used to be and assume that Jane and I were doing the same thing. Our argument is over, and I have time to cook and eat a sandwich. Belle, Carol, and Jane have already returned to the lake to continue fishing. Taking a beer, I settled down on a chaise long outside and drank at least six more bottles. The next morning, before dawn, I looked at Jane's window again, hoping to see her, but my efforts were in vain. She remained elusive. Pam, on the contrary, insisted on joining me on a fishing trip and almost never left my side, depriving me of the opportunity to be alone. 
Wherever I went, she followed me relentlessly, especially when Jane was around. By Thursday evening, I was so depressed that I was already dreaming of returning home, despite the fact that we planned to leave on Saturday morning. On Thursday evening, while we were enjoying drinks at the pier, Bill found out about the situation and asked about Pam's well-being. Sensing his concern, I told him that Pam was struggling with deep self-doubt. Intrigued, Bill asked if she had any good reasons for her self-doubt. Although I hesitated to go into details, I confirmed that there really are reasons. Our conversation continued for a long time while we sat engrossed in the dialogue and sipping beer. But I must admit that I was not averse to drinking too much. In the end, I blurted out disturbing details about the view from our kitchen window to Jane's bedroom. Pam witnessed something she shouldn't have done, which led to a number of troubles. Although I didn't tell him about the nature of these troubles, I think he guessed it anyway. The last thing I said to him that evening was to express my pleasure from our fishing together and regret that it was just one day. On Friday evening, we packed up most of our gear so that we could leave early on Saturday morning. So out of habit, I woke up early on Saturday morning and instinctively looked at Jane's bedroom window. To say I was shocked would be an understatement. Jane was standing in the bathroom, her body still wet from the bright light of the fluorescent lamps. After carefully examining the house to make sure we didn't miss anything, we went outside and got into the car, ready to leave. Bill came out to say goodbye to us, and I asked him to convey my thanks to Jane. His puzzled expression made me explain that Jane would understand everything. That day when I was driving home, the only thought that occupied me was relief that the vacation was finally over. Memories of the past week haunted me, reminding me that Pam had most likely come to the realization that everything had changed and would most likely remain so for a long time. The realization of her fantasy led to the fact that a gap formed between us, which seemed insurmountable. During the four-hour drive home, I barely uttered more than a few words. To tell the truth, that's exactly what I wanted. My mind was still preoccupied with the vivid images of the performance Jane had staged for me that morning but Pam was forced to fill this void with banal conversations, mainly about our recent fishing trip, about successfully caught fish, and about the pleasant moments she experienced. Having exhausted all the topics related to fishing, she moved on to discuss her plans for our return home. I realized that my love for Pam had reached its lowest point. As soon as we got home, one of my first actions was to go online and study everything I could about sexually transmitted diseases. Pam, you are the only woman I have ever truly loved and desired. That's probably why it was so painful for me to find out that you don't have the same feelings for me. Oh Frank, I'm deeply sorry for hurting you. You're the only one I really love. She was just a fleeting fantasy that I wanted to realize. Now that it's over, I promise that all my love will be just for you. I will never betray you again. I am deeply attached to her and showed my concern. Before heading to work on Monday morning, I asked Pam to make an appointment with her doctor and made it clear that I would accompany her. Fortunately, Pam's doctor turned out to be a woman, which might have allowed Pam to feel calmer compared to a male doctor. On Thursday morning, we visited her doctor, who informed us that a blood test can detect any bacterial infection, while viral infections can manifest up to six months. The doctor recommended that Pam visit the doctor monthly for the next six months for additional blood tests. She explained that the blood test does not reveal a viral infection but antibodies produced by the body to fight infection. It was these antibodies that had to be found. She made an appointment with us in two weeks to get the results of the analysis. Two weeks later, we got a positive result. Pam had no bacterial infections, and the STD test was also negative. The following week, Pam informed me that she would be coming home late on Wednesday night. Pam and her colleague Susie, who also worked as a lawyer's secretary in their office, planned to have dinner together and talk. Mentioned that Susie, who was only 22 years old, felt pressure from her boyfriend who demanded that she get married despite the fact that Susie did not want to end the relationship. She admitted that she did not feel ready to marry him as she was not sure that she loved him enough. Pam felt Susie needed to discuss her feelings and make sure her decision was right before making a lifetime commitment. As for me, I cooked my own dinner on Wednesday. After drinking a beer, I started working on some unfinished business which I often neglected. When I brought them home around 8 o'clock, I heard the sound of Pam's car pulling up to the garage. When she came into the house, I asked if she wanted something to eat or just a beer, 
choosing the latter. Pam quickly took a beer and settled into an easy chair in the family room. Then she started talking about Susie's various problems with her boyfriend. The following Wednesday was similar to the previous one, although Pam's arrival was a little delayed. For the next three weeks, a similar work schedule was maintained, except that Pam began to come home well after midnight. In the fourth week, I had a feeling of suspicion that made me check the veracity of Pam's explanations. So the next Wednesday, when Pam finished work, I sat across the street in a bookstore, carefully watching the entrance to her workplace, the law office. At exactly five o'clock, Pam came out of the door, accompanied by another woman. They walked a few blocks and entered a charming restaurant. Intrigued, I followed them unnoticed and slipped into the establishment unnoticed. When I went inside, I noticed their booth located at the back of the hall. In order to maintain a certain freedom of action, I decided to sit in a booth on the opposite side. From there, I could watch them without being easily noticed. A waitress came to their table, and it was obvious that they were having dinner. In full, as soon as the waitress left, they resumed the conversation, and as I understood the story Pam told me was indeed true. Meanwhile, my own waitress came over to take my order. Not wanting to burden myself with a hearty lunch in case of their sudden departure, I settled on a sandwich and a drink. I watched them enjoying their meal while having a continuous conversation. When the waitress returned to clear the table, they took another step forward and ordered a bottle of wine. After the wine arrived, each of them poured himself a glass and continued the conversation, leisurely sipping the delicious drink. Looking at my watch, I realized that it was already seven o'clock. At that moment, I came to the conclusion Pam was honest with me. She just offered support and friendship to a girl experiencing relationship problems. I took my bill and went to the cash register to pay. Just as I was about to leave, two people came through the door. Although I immediately recognized Joe in one of them, the second one remained unfamiliar to me. Without thinking, they headed to the booth where Pam and Susie were still enjoying their wine. After taking their seats, they smoothly resumed the conversation. Both girls turned in their direction and exchanged kisses on the cheek, which indicated that they knew each other. Realizing this, I quickly paid the bill and headed for the street. Crossing it a few minutes later, both couples left the restaurant and quickly got into a brand new Buick parked right at the entrance. Before I could react, they pulled away from the curb and disappeared. My car was parked two blocks from the restaurant, and I couldn't chase them. When the shock of meeting Pam and Joe overwhelmed me again, I felt like I was getting sick. I desperately needed to find a place to sit down. I noticed a bar located just a couple of doors away from where I was standing and decided to go there to drown my sorrows in a bottle of beer. Sitting there, I couldn't stop berating myself for not tearing up Joe's business card. But I reasoned like this, if Pam really wanted to cheat, she would have found another way to do it. These thoughts ignited anger in me, and I realized that I had to take revenge not only on Pam but also on Joe. After drinking wine and thinking hard, I returned to the car and went home. Even though I still felt emotionally drained, I managed to develop several strategies that gave me a glimmer of hope for a bright future. Now that Pam has fulfilled her wishes, it's my turn to achieve what I've been striving for. Exhausted, I climbed into bed, anticipating a restless night. But to my surprise, I quickly fell into a deep sleep and woke up only the next morning. Not knowing when Pam got home, I went down the stairs and saw her sitting at the kitchen table and savoring a cup of coffee. Surprisingly, she looked cheerful and the last night did not affect her in any way. Yesterday I had a difficult and exhausting night. I was on the verge of waking you up before I went to work, she said. Yes, I replied, it was a long night, but especially difficult. Do you want to discuss this? she asked. Not now. Maybe we'll talk about it later in the morning. I turned to my friend, who was interested in digital photography, for advice. I asked, what are the best digital cameras for shooting in low-light conditions? After receiving his recommendations, I didn't waste any time and immediately purchased the best camera I could find. When I got home, I immediately started looking for Joe's business card. It took a while, but eventually, I found it in a secret compartment of her bottom drawer, hidden under a collection of seductive underwear that I had never paid attention to before. Curiosity got the better of me, and I began to examine her underwear in the laundry basket. To my horror, I saw them at the bottom stained with something that had dried up over time. 
it was irrefutable evidence confirming my suspicions. On Tuesday evening, Pam told me that she was going to meet Susie again after work on Wednesday, which would delay her return home. She spoke in detail about Susie's serious condition and how she tirelessly tries to help her. On Wednesday evening, I chose an elegant look consisting of black jeans and a fitted sweatshirt. Taking my camera, I looked into the nearest subway store to buy a sandwich and a refreshing Coke for the road. By 5 o'clock, I was back at Pam's place of work, but this time I decided to stay in the car. When they left the building, I followed them unnoticed, watching their every move. In the end, they brought me to the very restaurant they visited last week. To preserve anonymity, I parked my car at a strategic distance from the entrance to the restaurant so that I could see the front door well. Knowing that I was going to have a two-hour wait, I settled down in the car, eating my sandwich and drinking a Coke. At exactly 7.05 a.m., a shiny Buick appeared, along with four people, Joe, an unknown man named George, and a duo named Pam and Susie. Without wasting any time, they all got into the car and quickly left. This time, I found myself in an advantageous position and followed them, keeping a safe distance of two or three cars. For more than 30 minutes, I diligently tracked their every move until we arrived in a residential area teeming with three-bedroom ranch houses in the style of the 1950s. It is noteworthy that this area was on the completely opposite side of the city from our house. In the end, their car drove into a driveway where presumably they were heading. When the garage door went up, they drove in and quickly closed it behind them. I drove further down the street, driving a short distance to make a U-turn. Back there, I found a parking spot about two houses down from the one they drove into. Although the sun had already begun to set during my journey, the darkness had not yet reached the level where it would be safe to engage in surveillance. As a result, I waited in the car for about 20 minutes. In the end, I plucked up the courage and approached the house. Upon closer inspection, I could not help but pay attention to the yard, overgrown with unkempt bushes and shrubs that were in dire need of pruning. Apparently, Joe or George lacked the ability to keep their yard in proper order. At the same time, thickets of bushes reliably hid me from prying eyes and allowed me to observe the family room through the patio door. I could easily watch them as they didn't seem to care about drawing the curtains despite the presence of a fence surrounding the backyard. Looking inside, I saw that all four of them were comfortably seated on the sofa, and among them were Joe and George. Carefully, after making sure that the flash was turned off, I started taking some pictures. I needed to capture each of them in a compromising picture and clearly identify them. After shooting about 30 to 40 frames, I suddenly caught a faint sound, as if someone was quickly moving away from me. Although I couldn't see them, I was sure that someone was watching me from a close distance. Returning to the car, I thought for a while and came to the conclusion that our marriage had undoubtedly come to an end. I had no chance to forgive her anymore. When I returned home, I was overcome by a feeling of sadness. I made a spontaneous decision to stop at the nearest bar and find solace in a bottle of Bud Light beer. Taking a seat in a secluded booth in the back row, I sipped a beer, thinking about what steps should be taken to start a divorce. I had no time to immerse myself in my thoughts when a bright young woman entered the bar and began to look around the room as if looking for someone. Noticing me, the only lone customer, she came to my table. Can I talk to you or rather ask you a few questions? She asked. Of course, I replied. I'm just drowning my sadness here. Hello, my name is Elizabeth, but my friends usually call me Liz. I have a question for you. Are you a private detective? She asked. Me? Oh no, I'm just a computer enthusiast, I grinned. You see, I've been watching your movements since you left the house on Jefferson Street. I even followed you to this bar, but I couldn't help but notice that you were taking pictures through the patio door. I wanted to ask if you would like to sell these pictures to me. Surprised, I asked, why do you need photos of my wife who is having an affair with several guys? She replied, well, you see, one of these guys is my husband. Feeling remorse, I quickly apologized. Tell me, is your husband Joe or George? I asked. It's Joe, she replied. And if I manage to get copies of these photos, then he will not remain my husband for long. So, let's figure it out. Joe has an amazing wife like you, but he's still risking his marriage for another woman, she confirmed. I will be happy to provide you with all these photos. 
Do you have a computer where we could download them? I asked. Yes, there is, she replied. If you come with me, we can do it right now. After finishing the rest of the beer, I followed her out of the bar and went to the parking lot where a spotless new Buick was waiting for me. I got into the car and drove behind her for about 10 minutes until we arrived at a large two-story house located in a wealthy area. When she pulled into the garage, I parked my car in the driveway right behind her. Following her example, I entered the house and immediately saw a breathtaking sight. The interior exuded exquisite charm, tastefully decorated with the most exquisite furniture that could only be bought. Wow, I couldn't help myself. Joe must be a really stupid person to have given up all this in order to take care of other women, I remarked. Indeed, she agreed. Joe is a complete fool. He foolishly believes that he is God's highest gift to women. We've been married for four years now, and I doubt he's ever been truly faithful to me. During our honeymoon, unfortunately, I witnessed how he inadvertently began to confide in other women. But the consequences of this are not limited to just me. He is also jeopardizing his job, our home, and a significant portion of our savings, she told in detail. She also mentioned that her father was categorically against her marriage with Joe. He warned her about Joe's true character and actions, which unfortunately coincided with her father's predictions. Moreover, her father insisted on concluding a prenuptial agreement, guaranteeing that if Joe ever gave her a reason for divorce, he would be left with nothing. Although she had repeatedly suspected him of infidelity, until now she had no concrete evidence. Interestingly, her father was one of the richest people in the city and owned the largest Buick dealership in the entire state. As a favor, his father gave Joe a job at the dealership, and Joe, in turn, helped George get a job there. Romance took place in the house inherited by George, which he acquired after the death of his parents. According to Liz, George was not particularly intelligent and owed his work solely to Joe's help. Now they were both facing unemployment, and she doubted that they would be able to find a new job due to insufficient qualifications. She led me into a room that looked like an office, where she showed me her most modern computer equipped with the latest technology. After uploading all the photos, we carefully selected the best pictures of each person, ensuring their easy recognition, and printed them out. After that, Liz asked how she could reward me for my help. I told her that the very fact of the divorce from Pam and the fact that Joe and George had suffered significant losses were sufficient retribution. I never came home, I went to Billy and Carol's house to find comfort and shelter in them. I told them everything in detail, and they were shocked by Pam's behavior. Bill offered me to live in their house for as long as it takes. I gratefully accepted their offer, and the next day I went to the lawyer's office and started the divorce process. Pam had been calling me nonstop for two days. She realized that something was wrong. But I eventually blocked her number and started dealing with our finances. I wanted her to suffer as I suffered from her antics. Time flew by quickly, and now we were assigned the day of our divorce. I hadn't seen Pam all this time. We only communicated through our lawyers. Having a lot of photos of Pam's infidelity, the court was on my side, and as a result, she got only 20% of the house after it was sold. I could have kept this house for myself by giving the right amount to Pam, but I didn't want to be there for more than a minute. I wanted to erase from my memory all the years of our marriage with this lying and unfaithful woman. And now it's been two years since I divorced Pam, and I'm happy. I have a wonderful son, Paul, who is only two months old, and of course, a wonderful wife. Yes, this is Jane. After my divorce from Pam, my friend made sure that Jane and I met. He realized that she liked me, and I liked her, and we realized that our meeting was not accidental, that it was fate that ordered it. And I'll tell you one thing, I'm incredibly happy. As for Pam, it's much worse for her. After her first betrayal with Joe, we had an intimate relationship, but I was careful and protected. Pam was diagnosed with HIV five months later. As the doctor said, the venereal disease can manifest itself within six months. I also gave Pam's family photos of her and Joe doing intimate things, and her father, who was a very strict and righteous person, forbade all members of their family to communicate and help Pam. This lying and corrupt woman was left without any support. Pam's emotional state was on the verge. She stopped coming to work, as a result of which she was fired. She was left without a job, an apartment, and her own family. 
Pam found solace in alcohol and illegal substances. There were even cases when she was picked up by the police in a state of strong intoxication and brought to the clinic. Pam's messy life has led her to ruin. Now she is missing one arm, and what will happen next is known to God alone. Story 2 As a teenager, I suffered from severe shyness. Communicating with people made me incredibly nervous, and sometimes I even doubted whether I was autistic. My interests were mainly related to reading books and playing video games, which further isolated me. The fact that I didn't have brothers and sisters didn't help either. Although my parents constantly urged me to engage in active recreation, play sports, and make friends, I found salvation in solitude. Our house was located on the outskirts of a bustling city, and our small town at that time was still in the stage of active growth. Many of the houses in our area were built on special projects, unlike the suburbs where the houses often looked the same. The nearest neighbor lived about 200 meters from our spacious house with five bedrooms and a huge yard. Both my mother and father held positions as professors at a famous university located in the city. Their busy work schedule forced them to leave home at 6 in the morning and return only after dark. This was partly due to our rural area with dirt roads. Every morning, I had to walk about half a mile to get to the place where the school bus picked me up at 7.30 in the morning. One day, when I was returning home after being picked up by the school bus, my neighbor suddenly stopped next to me and offered to give me a ride. It seemed a little strange to me, since my house was very close, but I decided to agree, just out of a sense of friendliness. Since I had already seen his car parked at my neighbor's house, and he looked very much like my neighbor, besides, it was the first time I was lucky enough to meet him in person. When we met, he greeted me for the first time, giving the impression that he knew me better than I knew him. He said that my parents often talk about me, shared that they told him about my habit of spending most of my time at home playing video games. He said that in his youth, he was an avid gamer, but since then, he has developed a passion for active recreation, which was the reason for his decision to move to our area. At that time, he was about 35 years old. Although he invited me to a barbecue at his house, I politely declined. I found my refuge in solitude, enjoyed my own company, and immersed myself in video games with my virtual friends on the internet. Over time, I noticed that my neighbor accidentally returns from work just at the moment when my boss drops me off and kindly offers to give me a ride home. During these trips, I was mostly silent, playing the role of a silent listener due to my inherent shyness. Meanwhile, he had long conversations, telling about various details of his life. He talked about his wife, profession, circle of friends, including his best friend named Marcus. In addition, he talked about his upbringing and almost everything about himself. He often talked about his longing for the serene countryside where noise does not interfere. In addition, he really appreciates his yard where you can have a barbecue and drink beer. At first, I assumed that based on his sociable nature, the main reason he offered me a ride was a desire to talk to someone. About a year later, when I was around 14 years old, my father gave me a luxurious gift for Christmas, an expensive night vision telescope worth about $5,000. There were few sources of constant lighting in our area, and my parents decided to buy a telescope. With the dark night sky in our area, we could observe a huge number of stars. The telescope was necessary so that I could observe the sky not only through a computer screen. Putting the telescope on the window on the top floor, I looked at the stars with admiration. In different directions, or depending on the location of the telescope around our site, I could observe planets such as Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. But over time, my interest in observing the stars began to fade, and I decided to point the telescope at the neighbors' houses. Since most of the houses were one story and surrounded by fences, I could look into their yards and occasionally peek into their windows. It became more and more interesting for me to get to know my neighbor, who kindly gave me a ride from school in the evenings, especially on weekends. I watched how he skillfully cooked food on the grill in the yard, and his playful three-year-old son frolicked nearby. His good friend Marcus often came to see him. Before that, he talked about Marcus. He explained that they work in the same company and like to spend time together on weekends. They use my wonderful night vision telescope. Despite the considerable distance between us, I could make precise adjustments and observe the smallest details on their faces. One quiet Sunday evening, I looked into the telescope and saw my neighbor talking to his friend Marcus. 
Marcus apparently was drinking, and my neighbor's wife, in the company of their cheerful son, was also in a quiet night environment. At first I decided that it would be a normal weekend and I was ready to go back to work at the computer but then something caught my attention and sparked my curiosity. I observed a rather strange phenomenon. Marcus imperceptibly touched the breasts of my neighbor's wife when he looked away this. Behavior threw me into complete confusion. For a moment I tried to understand the reasons for Marcus's actions while my neighbor remained indifferent. I noticed that she made an effort to remove his hand but interestingly did not try to pull away from him. In what struck me was the audacity of their actions especially in the presence of their innocent three-year-old son at the age of fourteen. I may have been inexperienced in matters of intimate life and did not understand the essence of social life, but I comprehended the seriousness of what was happening before my eyes through the prism of a telescope. Their behavior completely captured my attention as I noticed that he started these illegal touches only when the neighbor's attention was distracted as if participating in a secret love game. The breaks between each touch could reach ten minutes which further intensified the intrigue of their secret contacts. Under the influence of growing curiosity, I made a rash decision to attach a recording device to the telescope and film what was happening. I diligently recorded what was happening until the moment when my neighbor retreated into the house, and Marcus abruptly got up from his seat and began passionately engaging in intimate affairs with my neighbor's wife. I was shocked by such frank behavior. At that time, my acquaintance with adult materials was very limited, and this meeting crossed all the boundaries of my understanding. Marcus hurriedly retreated as soon as he saw that the neighbor had returned, and I was both surprised and alarmed that he was taking such a risk. What if he faced the consequences of his actions and was caught in the act? During all this time, I noticed that my neighbor's wife made no attempt to interfere or stop Marcus's actions. It looked like she was actively involved and enjoying their illegal games. At that moment, I did not have any feelings of remorse or pity for my neighbor, although I considered him my friend because of his constant tricks over the past year. My main emotion was the complete excitement of the spectacle. With the onset of darkness and the end of the night's romance, they all went to the house together. My neighbor was walking in front, carrying his son in his arms, and Marcus and my neighbor's wife were behind. As they walked, Marcus boldly put his hand under the dress of the neighbor's wife. The darkness of the night, illuminated only by the faint light of the moon, provided them with secrecy, hiding their actions from prying eyes. I was struck by the audacity of Marcus, who brazenly explored intimate places while being in such close proximity to an unsuspecting neighbor. At the time, I didn't find their behavior repulsive or disgusting. It wasn't until the following week, perhaps on Wednesday when a neighbor once again offered me a ride, that I realized how sharp the contrast was between his happy ignorance and the reality of his friend's intimate meetings with his wife. Unaware of the events that had taken place, the neighbor enthusiastically talked about the pleasant moments he had experienced over the weekend, completely unaware of the depths of his intimate life his friend and his wife had plunged into. I sympathized with him and did not dare to reveal the truth. On the way home, I was tormented by a sense of guilt for having experienced the excitement of witnessing the betrayal of my housemate by his close friend. Having plucked up the courage and decided to correct the situation, I decided to inform him about it at the next meeting. Fortunately, fate was on my side. The very next day, he politely offered to give me a ride again. Still, that day, my attention was focused on something else. I was busy thinking about how to tell him the terrible news that his wife was having an affair with his close friend. The weight of this revelation overwhelmed my thoughts, and it was difficult for me to find the courage to utter these words. I remember him driving up to my house and patiently waiting for me to open the car door, and I was still immersed in my inner struggle, trying to find the right words to convey this bitter truth to him. He felt my inner agitation when I tried to express my thoughts with visible difficulty. I sat completely speechless, as if I had fallen into a state of confusion similar to the state of a child. I tried to find the words, hardly making coherent sentences. Sensing my confusion, he turned off the car engine and looked at me with a surprised expression on his face, worried. He asked about my health. Finally, the words involuntarily burst out of my mouth, your wife is having an affair with Marcus. Without wasting a minute, I hurriedly opened the passenger door and disappeared, running up to my own front door. I barely unlocked it, trying to find shelter in the walls of my house. Climbing the stairs, I looked out the window and saw that his car was still standing on the road where he dropped me off. After three minutes, 
which seemed like an eternity to me, he finally left. Remembering this moment, I now laugh at how much I was worried. Communicating with people has always caused me incredible anxiety. I had difficulty keeping eye contact, and it was this seeming awkwardness that made me an easy target for bullying during my school years. At some point, I even doubted whether I was autistic, but over time, I realized that this was not the case. The next day, when the school bus pulled up to my boarding place, I quietly prayed that I would not meet the neighbor. But my hopes were dashed when I noticed his car waiting for me, which meant trouble was coming. It was an absolutely incredible case that he was waiting for me like this. I tried to move away, but he called out to me to get my attention. Reluctantly, I got into his car and stared at the dashboard, trying not to look him in the eye. He began to talk about the revealing fact that I had shared the day before about his wife's relationship with Marcus. He confessed that my words had not left his mind since our meeting, and suspicion was born in him. He was overcome with anxiety and asked how I knew about their possible connection. Since he knew about my peculiarities and differences from other children, it became clear during the conversation that he could not leave the idea that I had some special abilities, perhaps even a psychic gift. In an attempt to shed light on the current situation, I began to talk about how my father gave me a telescope. From my height, his house was clearly visible, and I noticed his family in the backyard, which was surrounded by some unusual signs. Interested in their activities, I began to watch them closely. At the same time, I decided not to talk about the fact that I recorded my observations, fearing the possible consequences of such actions. My isolation as an extremely shy child only made the situation worse. When I shared my discoveries with him, his reaction was filled with anger, frustration, and obvious tension, which did not allow me to understand whether his emotions were directed at me. He quickly drove to my house, his words sounded rude, obscenities. He wanted to harm his wife and Marcus. After dropping me off, he hurriedly left, heading for his house, greatly concerned about his volatile behavior. I had already decided not to disclose this recording, fearing that it could incite violence. For the next few weeks, he did not appear in my usual surroundings. All this time, I spent looking through the telescope, hoping to see him, but I only managed to see his wife and son. In the third week, I finally saw him, but something changed. He became somewhat distant and was not very willing to enter into conversation. True, he mentioned that he and his wife were going to divorce, but I refrained from asking for details. I learned about the divorce from my parents, who, as it turned out, were friends with him. They discussed the neighbor's divorce, fortunately without my participation. Unfortunately, I didn't meet with my neighbors anymore, as they eventually moved out of the area. Now, after 11 years, I have noticeably transformed. I have become a more sociable person with a real circle of friends, those who support you in difficult times. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to look for the neighbor on Facebook, and then I discovered that a new stage in his life had begun. He got married again and created a new family. I had the idea to share the notes with him, but I constantly convinced myself otherwise. I was thinking that it might reopen old wounds, doubted whether it would be really useful, and at the same time, I was thinking about the legality of such an act. 